We are ready to go. And uh, dear colleagues and dear participants to this uh, webinar, we're happy today to greet you on this uh, Wednesday morning in Moscow and uh, afternoon in Singapore. Today we gathered together to discuss a very urgent topic, uh, managing pandemics through innovation and technology. The global pandemic has brought about collective efforts among nations to overcome challenges faced in the healthcare, social and economic sectors by developing new solutions and technologies. And in the fight against COVID-19, there have been many innovations introduced by organizations, SMEs and startups around the world, and especially in the healthcare space. Today, we will share with you challenges and opportunities present from three distinct perspectives, administrator, corporate and consumer, and also learn about transformation of the biomedical industry, rising trends and how your business can address these global emerging needs. This webinar is brought to you by Enterprise Singapore, Moscow International Medical Cluster and Sistema Asia, along with their partners. My name is Daria Lipatova and I'm Head of Strategic Partnerships at Nusa Centara, a sustainable resource development company, and I will be hosting this webinar for the next hour. So our event has two major parts, the five minute presentations from our experts and general Q&A session. Please feel free to send the questions to my Telegram account at D bottom space Lipatova or to the chat below in Zoom. Please mention your name and whom you are addressing the question to. We're happy to have such prominent speakers today and let me introduce them. Yogi, Regional Group Director, Russia and CIS countries at Enterprise Singapore. Faina Filina, Director of Marketing and PR, Moscow International Medical Cluster. Dr. Yaslav Ashikmin, MD, PhD and Cardiologist, CEO Advisor at Moscow International Medical Cluster. Dr. Kirill Masliev, MD, PhD therapist and medical director of Day One Foundation. Dr. Kirill Kayem, Senior Vice President for Innovations Development at Skolkovo Foundation. Vladimir Diakov, Head of Business Development Programs at Moscow Innovation Cluster Fund. Sofia Yartseva, Project Lead, Office of Digital Transformation at Metsi Group. And Sergei Sidorov, Chairman of Metscan Group. For the introductory remarks, let me pass the word to the representatives of main organizers of this event, Enterprise Singapore and Moscow International Medical Cluster. Yogi, please. Thank you, Daria. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. And if you're in Moscow, do a very good day. Thank you for being a part of this session between Russia and Singapore medical practitioners and technopreneurs. My name is Yogi. I come from an organization called Enterprise Singapore. Our main role is to support Singaporean companies in building their capability, helping them innovate, and helping them internationalize. We also play a role in developing Singapore as a startup hub. These are unprecedented times in more ways than one. The scale of the pandemic to lives and its disruption to businesses has not been seen in recent decades. Perhaps what is also unprecedented is the role that innovation and technology is playing in managing pandemics, from clinical measures like test kits to advancements in supply chain, which facilitate the continuity of trade, and tools to facilitate safe distancing. As restrictions ease, innovation through technology will become more important in ensuring our loved ones and livelihoods are insulated from future risks. In this session, we have put together an excellent group of speakers who will share both public and private sector experiences. We also have a good group of participants who will be involved, who have been involved in managing the COVID-19 situation. Together, we hope to tease out key issues that need to be resolved through technology. Perhaps some of these solutions already reside with us, and I hope we can develop new collaborations that seek to address this pandemic and other solutions you seek. In conclusion, I'd like to thank our partners, the Moscow Innovation Medical Cluster, Sistema Asia, our speakers, and you, the participants. Yes, sure. Here's hoping you all have a very fruitful webinar 
and wishing you the very best of health. Thank you. Thank you, Yogi Faina. Uh, dear colleagues, thank you for your participation in our event. Uh, I am Faina Filina. I am the head of external communications of the International Medical Cluster. Uh, and I'm very happy to see you today. For us, uh, for the International Medical Cluster, and for me personally, it's a great honor to become a partner uh, and the uh, co organizer of such an important event as uh, our middle, uh, is, is our round table uh, managing pandemics through innovation and technology. Uh, it's um, it's very important for us to have such partners as uh, Enterprise Singapore uh, and Systema Asia. Um, uh, the goal, the main mission of the international medical cluster is to transfer advanced medical technologies, uh, exchange experience between doctors and scientists uh, from different countries of the world. Uh, on our territory, uh, the world's leading clinics, R&D laboratories, medical universities and technology parks are being built and operated. Uh, and through our activities, we want to improve the quality of medicine in our country, in Moscow and in Russia. Uh, you know, the pandemic has shown once again how important it is to the country for medicine to be at a level uh, to work smoothly and effectively and to have all necessary technologies to cope with it. I'm sure that uh, uh, by uh, utilizing our international platform with uh, such a worthy uh, team of expert speakers, we will be able to discuss um, innovations, medical technologies that will be forefront uh, in this new period of post-pandemic normality. After all, uh, this is uh, one of the main issues today, uh, how we will live and do business after the pandemic, how the healthcare sector will be transformed globally and uh, what technologies will come to the fore to prepare the population for a second wave today and pandemics in the future. Uh, I'm sure this will be a very interesting discussion and I wish all of us a successful event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paina. And uh, for the first expert presentation, let me invite Dr. Ashikmin. Yaroslav, uh, would you open the session with sharing your view of the challenges posed by COVID-19 and new realities we have just encountered? Thank you very much. So, we medics were waiting for this epidemic. It was absolutely unavoidable due to the nature of the world in which we live. And now we have around a half million deaths due to the current viral infection. That's around 0.006% of overall population. That's 7,000 in Russia and 26 cases in Singapore. Is it a lot or little? The epidemic found us unprepared. We were not so good in virology. And now we cannot explain such dramatic difference in sensitivity to the virus and also in epidemiology because we cannot predict whether there is seasonality or whether we will be, have a second wife of epidemics. And virus spread models are absolutely imperfect. I would say that humanity, inspired by certain success, was arrogant, overestimating itself and got a click on the nose. I don't want to say why things about the importance of preparing healthcare system and developing drugs against Corona. I would like to talk about the epidemic, how that should reform it, the brains of decision makers, about correct and right resource allocation, the greater gap in the exposure for the many disease, uh, risk factors and death per se, uh, is make the more difficult people to get the importance of uh, preventive measures that we see in the health, uh, in the heart disease, for example. Now we see that a gap is narrowing. Uh, and that is not like in dental pain that you have a pain and go to the dentist really and prevent the infections. But the gap is narrowing. That's the very important moment that the medicalization of society that we see should work. That's the time to society to catch the initiative from pharmaceutical companies in determining what this is and how we want to treat. Now the real strategy is to make medicine that sell well. People care us that not interested in someone else's pain. 
We talk a lot about the equality of human lives, but usually that's only just slogans that remain on the paper. Nobody wanted to deal with infections that we will get. In some years, more people died from malaria, more people than heart disease, until Gates decided to do charity. Everyone didn't care about the death of malaria. We made cancer drugs, drugs for cancer treatment for hundreds of thousand dollars, saving the few months of life. We lived in information bubbles that we got this word. When solving local and important tasks of fighting medicine for COVID, we must think strategically. First of all, we have to start a difficult conversation about the cost of human life in different parts of the world or different ages. I suggest that's equal, but don't know about you. About how much we were willing to pay for saving lives. Because the house in economy, in economics now, is born of the taboo, taboo of speaking about these topics. The epidemic brings together decision makers in different areas. That's very important. We also need to speak with society. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We just need point A to start talking about the connection between human lives and the economy. Point B, to use well-developed HDA tools, health technological assessment. Once again, this should be done by us, society, not governments, agencies, politics, and pharmaceutical companies. People will forget about the epidemic in a couple of months. We, need, we must to cease to catch the moment in order to start the conversation about the equitable right healthcare, about where we should move in medicine. That is what, that is what I want to tell you. That is what you should remember now when the epidemic in development countries is on the decline. We all need to get vaccinated. Vaccinated against narrow mind mindedness, non participational intellectual myopia, and short sightedness. We must begin the movement towards healthcare that is truly in the interest of the people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yaroslav. And uh, well, indeed, uh, uh, the dialogue between society and, uh, and government is continuing. And uh, that's actually why we are here today. And uh, also, indeed, the past six months have drastically changed the landscape of uh, interhuman uh, uh, relationships, as well as biomedicine. And our next speaker has been also personally involved in uh, fighting pandemics in Russia, being practicing doctor himself, Dr. Masliev uh, serves as medical director of the Day One Foundation, providing personal protective equipment to the Russian hospitals fighting COVID-19. And I would like to invite Dr. Masliev to continue our session and share views on the lessons learned from the pandemics and what we should know about the trends for the future. Dr. Mansleif will continue in Russian with consecutive translation provided by my colleague at Enterprise Singapore Russia, Maxim Yuhrimo. Thank you, Daria. I will start in English and if I will have some problems, I will ask, kind of ask to, to help me with translation. First of all, it's, of course, it's a great honor for me to be a part of uh, this amazing webinar and uh, thank, I would like to say thank you, Daria, and all your team, all Skolko team, for this opportunity to take part in this uh, webinar and uh, all of uh, guests of this webinar and of all of uh, participation. So, uh, uh, yes, Dar, you are right. I, I, I'm involved in coronavirus fight in maybe 24 hours uh, a day, more than uh, three months. First of all, because I am a doctor. Uh, second one, because uh, I'm a, a, a head of a medical uh, department of uh, our charity foundation, day one, and uh, uh, we have delivered to, not only to Russia, we have delivered uh, some medical equipment, some medicine uh, to Italy, to Spain, and there was about 25 planes and about uh, 60 
tons of some medical equipment and uh, some medicine. Uh, uh, and we do a job uh, till, till, this, till these days. And finally, uh, I, I'm with coronavirus 24 hours a day because I was ill uh, coronavirus. Um, I, get, I, get, I get the, way, the virus from the patient. So uh, you are really right that um, uh, I'm, I'm like in love with coronavirus. So we have lots of problems and we, we have lots of questions that we didn't have answers till that time. First of all, I would like to say about World, World Health Organization. For me, it was a big surprise uh, of, uh, of, of the situation uh, with the World Health Organization. I think that they did they, their job terribly uh, because I think they should be the first one who make some some decisions, uh, decisions uh, about coronavirus. They they should make some directions, not only for for doctors, uh, for healthcare system. They should uh, give some advice for the people, and uh, they say different different uh, words uh, all the time. For example, first of all, they say you didn't you didn't uh, have to make uh, to wear masks. Uh, then three three months ago, three months three months later, they say you should wear a mask, and that's on. They didn't say everything about chloroquine. They didn't say everything about some uh, diagnostic tests and so on, so on. So I think that the work of uh, World Health Organization should be changed, or there should be a new organization that cooperates with the governments that cooperates with healthcare systems and uh, cooperates with uh, with uh, people the second uh, situation that uh, uh, caused a lot of lot of discussion it's uh, of course tests because nobody knows what tests can 100% 90% say about coronavirus do you have coronavirus or do you, don't you have coronavirus? How how many tests should we should we do? Uh, do you should you use uh, PCR tests or should you use express tests and so on? There are a lot of lot of uh, uh, light positive, light negative tests and so on. So uh, there are a lot of questions that uh, we should uh, answer. Uh, I think uh, sometimes later. But the main thing that I would like to speak about, about uh, the, of course, about the World Health, Health Organization and that we should really change the cooperation with this system. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you Kirill. And um, I would like to also invite uh, our audience to follow Dr. Masliev's Instagram at Dr. Masliev and listen to the weekly broadcasting programs at 11 p.m. Moscow time. Uh, each Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kirill. And uh, so lately, uh, we have been really informed about support measures provided from the government uh, for traditional and technological businesses to survive after lockdown season. And the cradle of Russian innovations, I uh, have been honored to be a part of it for the last, almost the last decade. This year celebrates its 10th anniversary. Of course, I'm speaking about the Skolkova Foundation. Having almost 2,500 startups in its ecosystem, Skolkova Foundation have launched a special initiative to support technologies helping to fight COVID-19. And with these words, I'm happy to invite Dr. Kirill Kayem, Senior Vice President for Innovations Development of the Skolkova Foundation, to share views on transformation of the biomedical industry and innovations that people and businesses now need. Please, Kirill. Thank you very much, Daria. Uh, definitely, I mean, I have uh, kind of optimistic view what's going on right now with the innovation as a response to coronavirus, because what we see in uh, worldwide landscape and as well what we see in the Skolko Foundation per se, we see that a lot of companies, big and small, targeting the uh, own uh, products they develop or changing the product they develop in direction to help uh, 
the human being with the situation uh, of pandemic. Uh, we uh, announced the special measures, special support measures for the companies, uh, like a fast track relating the coronavirus, uh, some financial support for those companies. And uh, it, it's working pretty well, I would say. Uh, from the moment when decided to make a special track, uh, we have more than 150 companies applied for the support for specific uh, products they developed against the pandemic. And uh, also I would say that even few of those products are already coming to the market, like one of the drugs, small molecule, against a specific treatment for coronavirus was uh, developed one of the Skolkova startup. It was registered in Russian Federation or diagnostic tools uh, developed uh, by different startups of Skolkov Foundation are registered for official medical use in Russian Federation. I would say that regulatory, uh, the Ministry of Healthcare in Russian Federation, also reacted fast and uh, reacted in the right way. It was the specific uh, uh, declaration, specific rule, when the new development can be registered and in a fast track and it's available and can be used till 31st of December uh, 2020. And it has to be registered again after December 2020 with the full scope of clinical, clinical trials. But in the sake of uh, provide the fast help to the present situation uh, for the product which really works, they have the shortened track of uh, clinical trials right now that's why that's allows us uh, as the country and that's allows a uh, new developed product be fast on the market yes risks are higher but as soon as uh, everybody under the risk with this pandemic situation i think it's a very smart step but talking about the tech development i would say it's, we split all the tech innovations in four, a few different blocks and uh, the first block which is very important that's diagnostics we see plenty of uh, fast diagnostics tools right now on the market, mostly uh, antibody tests, but the quality of this antibody test, which was mentioned by Kirill as well, uh, is very low quality and nobody understands what is the uh, preciseness of the test, what is this uh, synthesis of, of the test. And we have a few products right now and we support few products right now, which has much higher uh, specificity and uh, much higher uh, sensitiveness of those tests. Uh, that's not only, on, only diagnostic tools, as well as we know the uh, indication of the virus in the body is the most precise diagnostic for the moment because still we don't have the guideline for WHO about the uh, uh, immune response of the body so nobody knows when antibody appear, uh, appears in the blood and how long would it work i mean immunoglobulin g nobody confirmed that uh, it works long enough to protect the person uh, against the second case of the disease and there are some data in china in korea that it was indicated as the some second case of the diseases for the people who already had coronavirus diagnosed before uh, but uh, concerning the, those tests, uh, which are PCR tests, it's also the big question because for the moment, the regular technology of PCR test is a rather long term uh, test that takes two or three days to provide the result to the patient. And we have few development uh, uh, here in Skolkova with uh, Skolkova startups, which uh, make the specific real time, I mean, or different type of real-time PCR, when the result is available uh, in uh, two, three hours after the test. And one of those tests is already registered as well in Russian Federation, and uh, it's available for the uh, clinical labs. And also it's available like a portable set with the device, which can provide uh, uh, real-time PCR re reaction, like in a small suitcase. Uh, and uh, that allows actually to provide with this suitcase and the set of uh, reagents uh, small clinics or regions uh, with, uh, where only paramedic is available and doctor is not available for the fast diagnostics. 
I know that uh, our startup, which uh, actually arranged part of the production of the Skolkovo territory, sell these tests not only in Russian Federation, but sell uh, those tests as well in some countries abroad. Like Latin America, they have some sales. And definitely in CIS countries, they provide some products. Actually, they are overloaded. It's uh, definitely high demand for this type of tests. But behind the diagnostics of the coronavirus itself and COVID-19 itself, it's very important to find the patients who have some complications after the disease because the coronavirus is not uh, dangerous by itself. And uh, you see it's a lot of people who actually has coronavirus without any symptoms at all. It's also one of the uh, tough, st uh, tough uh, point about the coronavirus. And uh, complication of the coronavirus is very important. And uh, the main uh, differential diagnosis is the CT. And the problem is we have enough CT scanners, but the picture of viral new pneumonia is kind of different with the regular pneumonia. And uh, what th that's why some startups which are working with AI usage for the image recognition in radiology are very uh, fast and very effectively move the developed uh, the product they developed initially uh, for uh, more for oncology I would say to the way that uh, AI, AI can you can be used for the diagnostics of uh, viral pneumonia uh, with a specific picture of COVID and actually uh, that helps very much because we have enough enough uh, CT scanners as I said but we don't have enough doctors for the high flow of patients to recognize this disease. And this solution is also works in some clinics, but it was registered in Russian Federation and can be used in the practical medicine. The second block of the technology, which is very important, it's definitely the treatment. And uh, as I already mentioned, one of small molecules was already registered in Russian Federation. It's one track, small molecules. The second track is um, uh, monoclonal antibodies. Uh, which can be actually repositioned against of coronavirus and showed its effectiveness against of coronavirus. Uh, as soon as we are talking about pandemic situation, the third big uh, part of the development is uh, antiseptics and barrier function. Everybody right now needs antiseptics, which is cheap, can be produced in the big volumes can be distributed easily because the distribution of the big volumes of antiseptics, logistics itself, it's uh, becoming expensive in those volumes. And uh, we have few developments and that's very also highly demanded uh, by the city governments, by the big uh, corporations, uh, th this type of the uh, innovations. And uh, as well about the barrier protection of the, of the patients, of the population, uh, we have a uh, few interesting projects like much more effective medical masks uh, filtering uh, small particles. Uh, even the person is coughing, for example, which is not obvious for the regular medical mask. Uh, we have right now like a barrier gates for the fast disinfection of the person who is coming into the building and can be mostly disinfected in 20 seconds, 15 seconds, which is again, very important in our new reality. And uh, as, as well for the social distancing, uh, for the uh, safe uh, of the health of the patients. Uh, the situation with the pandemic is a huge boost for the telemedicine. Uh, we, uh, it was growing slowly, but it's a, huge kick for the development of the product, increasing the quality of the product. And as well, it's a big kick, I would say, for the uh, regulators, for the Ministry of Healthcare, which allows right now much uh, flexible usage of the telemedicine consultations, diagnosis than it used to be before. And I think even we stop the coronavirus, uh, th those change would be, and this trend would be uh, very successful. Um, also, I would mention, uh, which is not only medical usage, but the VR simulation and uh, VR AR uh, practices and the medicine is very important because we actually facing the situation and maybe Kirill will confirm it uh, when we have a plenty of medical staff which never had any deals with the pandemic situation. Actually, they had some courses of epidemiology many years ago in the university 
And right now they are facing the situation when they are obliged to work in the so-called red zones with the infected patients, risking their health and the health of the uh, next people they meet. And uh, it's very difficult to train them exactly in the red zones, but VR and AR uh, products allows to, to train those medical staff uh, without even entering the red zone. And when they're actually facing the real danger, they already prepared. And uh, also we have some products and some tech uh, required not by the medic medical needs itself, but more about social distancing, distant work, distant study. So all IT companies developing the product in this segment uh, are booming. And uh, as soon as we are working and uh, entertaining ourselves and studying uh, distantly, uh, the cybersecurity became much uh, more important issue and the companies in the cybersecurity uh, area is highly demanding. So it's like a short review of the main tech areas uh, which are demanding right now. Thank you. Thank you, Kirill. And uh, I have been informed by the organizers that uh, you uh, shall leave now. But before, before that, we have just um, encountered a question uh, that I would like to address to you. Uh, uh, taken that we have just uh, uh, launched the uh, soft landing program for international companies. So the question comes from uh, Sergei Arutunyan. What could be done from Russian side to increase cooperation between Russian and Singapore med companies? What Singapore companies need for further development? Okay, I mean, Skolko is the open system and uh, definitely all our startups are uh, giving the information freely and openly on Skolko website. So you can just enter the website, filter the specific technology you need, not only medical technologies, find the contact of the startup, contact the startup and check if the technologies can be used in Singapore. The second possibility, we have uh, an agreement with uh, System Asia and uh, some Skolko startups are already uh, on the spot, just putting the feet on Singapore land and trying to bring their product, their development in Singapore and Southwest e Asia, uh, because it's already demanded. We know some commercial successes of uh, Skolkovo companies uh, in Singapore already. And the, sec and the third option, if uh, some Singapore company would like to be in Skolkovo or would like to check the Russian tech uh, market. Skolko is the best gate to do this. We have also sp special program, so-called lending program for international companies in Skolko. It's like uh, starting with a two-week session explaining how to work in Russia, how to find the services you need to organize the company, how to find the partners, what support Skolko can provide uh, for this type of the companies. And later on, we're providing some working space in our co-working. We're providing some contacts of the partners for registration of the companies. We are bringing the bridges with the scientific and business community because we are more oriented on the tech development. So scientific community is needed. And you are warmly welcome to participate in those programs. Thank you. Thank you, Kirill. And Thank you. Uh, Continuing our presentation session on the leading Russian entrepreneurship ecosystems, this is a special pleasure to introduce uh, Vladimir Dyakov, Head of Business Development Programs at Moscow Innovation Cluster Fund. The cluster has not only been deeply integrated in the policies uh, to fight pandemics, but also launched a series of business development programs for uh, tech businesses. These include a new Moscow MedTech Accelerator, Vladimir, uh, today technological companies from Russia and Singapore are also watching this webinar. And could you please share a brief introduction to the cluster and MedTech Accelerator? Uh, okay, <clears throat> uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, uh, let's say Moscow Innovation Cluster was uh, really involved in all this pandemic situation, uh, for example, well, uh, let's say we are the bad and most hated guys who provided uh, management of uh, digital pass system in Moscow. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and uh, uh, we are as well uh, providers of the government support uh, to uh, small and uh, middle-sized enterprise 
uh, from the Moscow government. So, uh, as uh, Ernst Young said, uh, the Moscow was the only city in the world, the only capital in, in the world, which provide a uh, special program for supporting business in, in the time of pandemic. Uh, speaking about uh, our uh, development programs, yes, uh, we, we have a Moscow Accelerator. It's a joint program together with uh, uh, agency of innovation uh, of Moscow and uh, now we have the second uh, track of the Moscow accelerator uh, Biomed Tech. Well it, it was uh, uh, let's say we, we, we were thinking about this uh, a track uh, maybe uh, from from December and uh, uh, we were negotiating with our partners and uh, well, uh, let's say our partners in this track are uh, Invitra and Himrar. Invitra uh, is uh, a leading company in the field of uh, testing for coronavirus, and uh, Himrar is uh, the only Russian company uh, producing uh, uh, the only approved uh, drug against COVID-19. Uh, as I understood, uh, it, wa it was. Uh, made together with uh, medical cluster of Skolkovo, by the way. Well, uh, if uh, I can uh, share a screen for the moment, I can show you the uh, one slide about Moscow Accelerator. Yes, please do so from your own computer. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, well, this is about our first track, digital services made by Yandex. And uh, by the way, uh, all 20 projects uh, participated in, in the program. Uh, well, uh, uh, all, all of them were very useful in, in, uh, in pandemic situation because uh, mostly digital services uh, were in a very high demand uh, for, for the last three months. And uh, the current track, Biomed Tech, our partners are Himrar and uh, in vitro. Uh, we have about 400 uh, projects applied, which was, uh, well, let's say uh, unexpected because I never thought that uh, we, 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 we could find uh, so much uh, uh, good projects in this uh, field. And uh, we have uh, quite, uh, let's say short uh, focus of the accelerator. So uh, mostly, uh, uh, I would say it's a scouting of our accelerator. We really managed to find uh, a lot of projects uh, which could be used by Himrar and Invitra. And uh, the main task of the accelerator is not to provide uh, some educational program or let's say development program for our participants. Uh, we, we, we are ready to provide uh, real pilots with uh, our partners and uh, uh, next week we will announce uh, 30 projects that will participate in the program and uh, we'll try to uh, test them in, uh, let's say, uh, working conditions uh, uh, until September, and uh, we uh, have, uh, let's say, expectations that uh, about 10, uh, 15 projects would be uh, uh, approved by our partners for the commercial use, for the industrial use. So uh, it's a real problem to uh, accelerate uh, projects in this field because uh, as uh, Kirill Kayem said, uh, well, uh, especially for pharma, it's uh, very hard to find uh, solutions uh, which are ready to uh, show something uh, usually the innovation process in pharma is uh, uh, inside 
uh, pharma companies. But uh, we, we, we have a very good scouting team and uh, we have a very good relations with uh, uh, science institutes and uh, 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 small teams in clinics uh, all over the Russia. And uh, you, you can see that uh, some solutions uh, of the projects are, well, could be very, very, very interesting. For example, uh, if we are talking about in vitro, uh, some uh, test tubes modifications, uh, well, uh, in, in uh, uh, real startup world, uh, usually this uh, type of project is not in high demand because, uh, well, uh, the, the cost of one tube is very small and it's uh, very hard to find investor for uh, this kind of project but in in uh, our situation we can uh, well uh, it, it was a demand from the side of in vitro and uh, we managed to find uh, uh, I think four or five projects which could be tested by in vitro and probably industrial applied so thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you for this insight. Uh, although Moscow Innovation Cluster is a relatively new uh, development institution, these initiatives, of course, um, are very prominent for uh, our businesses. And I hope that as a follow-up to this session, we will be able to distribute uh, the general presentations uh, with the details of uh, MedTech Accelerator program. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we are approaching uh, to this last part of uh, our webinar today. We are moving to the final part of presentations provided by uh, the Russian private healthcare sector. And our next speaker represents Metsi Group, which is the leader in Russian private healthcare and have been deeply involved in fighting pandemics throughout the country. Now Metsi is helping businesses to keep their employees healthy by including providing um, special uh, COVID testing systems. I'm inviting now uh, Sofia Yartseva, project lead at Office of Digital Transformation at Metsi Group, to share current challenges and uh, demands fa faced by healthcare institutions from a private healthcare perspective. Thank you, Daria, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate my screen now because I have prepared a quick presentation for this venue. Uh, can you see my screen or not? No. Mm. Uh, yes, just a second. This is probably a, an access issue. Can you see it now? Still pending. Oh, <laughs> so. Uh, I will start by saying that um, Medsi Group is the leading medical organization in Russia, uh, leading in private sector. And uh, most importantly, we were the first uh, private medical organization that provided COVID-19 patients uh, with uh, the full scale of medical services. We transformed one of our facilities and dedicated it in exclusively for the COVID-19 uh, patients. It is located in the suburbs of Moscow and uh, we transferred all the medical personnel there and provided them with housing and uh, you know, all the services we could to ensure that they don't contact with their families and don't transfer the disease uh, further. I'm not sure why I still can't demonstrate. Oh, this should be it, right? That's right. Oh, great. So, um, so as you can see here, we are one of the largest chains of uh, healthcare facilities in Russia. Uh, we are the leader of voluntary medical insurance sector and uh, quite coincidentally this is one of our main streams of revenue. We have over 
4,500 uh, uh, 4, uh, medical doctors and nurses and overall about 7,300 employees, which is quite a big <laughs> uh, stuff, you see. Uh, there is a number of challenges that medical organizations have to face in Russia. And I think most probably all over the world, we are facing major shifts in both market structure, uh, regulatory systems and culture. Uh, but most importantly, uh, the patient behavior has changed in the past couple of years because other industries such as um, cosmetics and uh, uh, traveling industries and recreation have uh, increased the quality of services. And now the patients are expecting the same from the medical suppliers. Uh, they expect uh, to access the services remotely, to get rid uh, of routine operations, and overall to have a smoother experience, uh, like in telecom, for example. So this is why we approach these uh, challenges by uh, the digitalization of medicine processes, both internal and external. And we are working in close juncture with uh, our government to ensure that uh, the amendments of laws regulating telemedicine uh, will be brought into practice. Uh, we have our own telemedicine platform, it's called SmartMed, and uh, we are now entering the uh, sandbox of uh, Russian Ministry of Economics and we will be testing the amendments uh, the first uh, in Russia. Here at Medsi we believe that digitalization is the main driver for the development of medical services and we strongly believe that from traditional services we have to go through digitalization to personalization and ultimately to health tech system that will provide not only treatment and rehabilitation after the treatment, uh, but also a whole bunch of services that will promote uh, healthy lifestyles and uh, disease preventions. Uh, here on the chart, you can see the message position on these uh, different uh, aspects of the future medical services. So we have now the comprehensive course of treatment. And we want to transfer from here to the whole health management system, uh, include uh, genetic information into our account when we personalize the offer to the patient and provide remote consultations and diagnostics to our patients to increase uh, the treatment uh, quality and overall experience. So for that, we have established the digital ecosystem. We started building the digital ecosystem of services uh, that are focused around uh, the three main uh, branches. So so-called, I am at the doctor's office. Uh, I have left the doctor's office and I want to stay healthy. And I am not currently in need of doctor's services, but I want to stay healthy healthy and I want to monitor my health so I can prevent any negative changes. Uh, the digital platform will allow us to both digitize and optimize the client path, to expand the product offer ultimately with the services for healthy people and to personalize the offers we provide uh, based on the analysis of patient data uh, from different sources, uh, both from uh, Medsi and from our partners of Systema. So ultimately, this digital platform will uh, integrate uh, different partners, uh, including suppliers of uh, individual services, healthcare providers, uh, and other patients and uh, clients. Uh, Messi will supervise and manage the platform and be uh, an arbiter between the members of the platform. So for that, we have established the Metsi Labs, which is an accelerator. Uh, it is a, a platform, a small company that will uh, make uh, the partner partnering easier for Metsi, which is a big company, obviously. We have all kinds of options for collaborations with startups, 
first of all, hackathons and accelerators, most importantly, providing pilot projects at Medsi clinics, uh, establishing partnerships and uh, creating joint ventures for collaborative development of novel services and products. We can also provide investments in capital uh, and non-monetary entry into the capital through the investment of Medsi's competence and medical data, which we have a lot of this week. So now I will focus more on what we did during the pandemic, because this is the time and the place when we started developing all our partnerships uh, at an increased speed. So first of all, we have already had a partnership uh, based on the AI analysis of medical images. We had all sorts of um, medical images uh, like mammograms and x-rays. And here during the pandemic, uh, we increased the number of services, including anal anal analysis, sorry, <laughs> analysis of uh, blood uh, of our patients who were screened for the infection so that uh, the patients are prioritized for further CT scans of the chest. Then these CT scans are also analyzed by the AI and they're prioritized for the doctor so only those who are at high risk uh, can be transferred to further PCR analysis of uh, the virus, which uh, ensures that the patients that are at uh, the, the most serious conditions are prioritized and get the help uh, sooner. Uh, the other thing was, as I said, we opened one of our uh, clinics exclusively for COVID-19 patients. And there uh, to ensure that not only the patients have the best service, but also that our own employees are at the lowest possible risk of infection, uh, we decided to implement the system of AI monitoring of patient care quality. So in three days, in only three days, we installed all the equipment and uh, started the surveillance that can do the following things. It can uh, prevent the falls by alarming the nurses that the patient is at risk. It can alarm the nurse if the patient has been out of the ward for too long period of time because he can faint in the corridor or have any other issue. So he ha has to be checked on. Uh, then it uh, monitors the implementation of medical protocols, including the fact that medical personnel is wearing uh, protection costumes. Uh, which is important both for the patient and for the clinical personnel. Uh, it also for the two-way remote communication between medical staff and uh, the patient. And uh, ultimately it reduces the burden on nurses because it uh, allowed us to cut in half the visits of medical personnel into the dirty zone, into the red zone because they don't have to check twice on the patient. They have all those uh, smart alarms and they usually know they have already checked upon this patient. They don't have to write it down or monitor uh, somewhere in the notebook. Uh, so ultimately, have, yes. Yeah, thank you uh, for, for your presentation. I mean that we are really coming closer to the uh, to 9, uh, 11, 11 a.m. Oh. Uh, in Moscow. Uh, but this, is, this was really interesting experience and I believe that we could continue our discussion with the participants uh, online. Yes, sure. Uh, I just wanted to invite everyone, if you have any solutions that we can test in our clinics or with our partners, which we have a lot also, uh, feel free to contact me. Daria has all the contact information. I will be help, happy to talk to you. Absolutely. And uh, our next speaker also uh, represents a private healthcare system uh, in Russia. Uh, the Metzken Group is one of the major players in Russian private healthcare, having a network of multidisciplinary medical centers across the country. It is also important to mention that the group has strong international experience in creating medical centers in cooperation with partners from the US and Israel. I'm inviting now Sergei Sidorov, chairman of Metzken Group, to continue our discussion regarding the challenges and demands faced by the private healthcare institutions. Good morning, everybody. 
I'd like to start by sharing uh, an old joke. I think it was around 1996 when the Western journalist asked uh, the former president of Russia, Mr. Boris Yeltsin, whether he can describe the state of affairs in Russia in one word. So Mr. Yeltsin thought for a second and said, good. Then the journalist continued on and said, can you actually describe it in two words? So Mr. Yeltsin thought again and said, not good. So I think it's a very good definition of uh, the challenges that the, uh, that the private sector, the private healthcare sector was facing uh, or is facing currently during the pandemics. If, uh, obviously we are practitioners here. So we had to face the realities as soon as the virus hit uh, Russia in its, uh, you know, in, its, in its full way. And the realities was, were as such that some of our clinics uh, had a major, uh, especially when the, during the lockdown, uh, the, uh, the revenue of some of our clinics has dropped by more than 75%. So it was actually a, a bit of a survival thing for us, uh, as, as, oh, just like for many uh, private uh, clinics in Russia, because people were in a lockdown, people were um, afraid to actually visit the hospital, and we actually had to come up with new solutions that uh, we have not tested before. So for us, the major three lines uh, helped turn around the businesses. One, you know, first and foremost were tests, 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 tests. You know, as, as soon as we could get hold of the rapid tests, which were available in Singapore and in other countries, we introduced them to the city of Moscow. The second solution was telemedicine. Uh, many speakers before mentioned that, uh, but uh, to develop that a little bit further, we believe that the overall home care is a major major trend globally and it's definitely going to hit uh, us uh, uh, you know uh, very very soon it, it, it seems like the virus has been the major trigger for the development of that and we definitely think that the telemedicine is just the first and the very very baby step towards the overall home care uh, solutions and um, and yeah, a lot has been already said about use of AI for CT scanning. We, we, we do have a partnership with the Russian uh, uh, National uh, 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 Welfare Fund to develop that. It's, it's early days, but we do believe that we, it, it's our house view that the virus is going to stay with us for at least two years. You know, whether it's going to come in waves, whether it's going to have uh, further spikes or not, but this is not, this is not going away anytime soon. So we're not, we're not really, you know, we're not really hoping that this is a one-off event that, uh, that's going to disappear. This is going to stay. Um, and um, all solutions like PCR tests, antibody tests, CT scans, uh, home care uh, is, is the only way that we can fight it before the vaccine is available. So, Daddy, I will not take any more of your time. I'm happy to answer any any questions if you have. It. Oh, thank you, Sergey. Actually, uh, we have now received uh, a question. I believe to uh, you and uh, Sofia uh, about uh, uh, like what is the percent of native population derived benefit from private health care in Russia, and does medical insurance play a vital role for private care? Uh, this comes from Ali uh, Shirazi at Chronic Care, PTE, LTD. Um, the private, um, the percentage of the private healthcare within the overall uh, system is 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 very small. I think it's, if I'm not mistaken, it's just just around fourteen percent uh, within the overall health healthcare system. So uh, we think that the private companies can definitely a bigger role in the overall system and we would be very happy to, we are happy to work with the government together and provide the know-how and solutions which are, which are sometimes difficult to, to implement at the government level. Okay, so if you do you have anything to add to, uh, to this? Yeah, so I can make a quick comment that many of the private companies work uh, also with uh, obligatory medical insurance patients. And uh, we have a certain number of patients that we can receive per month, per period for advanced procedures like scanning or uh, tomography, etc. This is some part, that it, at some part we collaborate with the government in this way. 
Okay, thank you. And uh, I believe, although it's already 11 a.m., uh, we have about 10 minutes to ask some more uh, questions, uh, to ask you some more questions from uh, the audience. And I believe that the next one comes to Yaroslav Ashikmin. I would like to um, ask you, like, what lead uh, should government agencies take to help public overcome the pandemic via technology and innovation? That's quite a difficult question. Thank you for this. Um, I suggest that uh, modern system of government agencies and ministries of health of different, uh, different countries uh, working in not in interest of people of the world. I think that we need to go to reformating of the whole medical systems. We need to uh, improve the influence of the society, of the ethics committees. Because now we see so many stakeholders, pharma, industry, politics, politics that like Trump saying good words about the Plaquenil that totally doesn't work. You see how it works. I don't believe that ministries of health of the world and WHO really might help us to go to the equally right ethic healthcare in the world. That's why I need to, uh, I suggest that we need to get to the society the new tools for health technology assessment and involve the society in the decision making. So, so regarding the ministries of health, we see that in many countries that's uh, uh, probably was do more bad than uh, that good. That's why in some countries I think that uh, we need to totally destroy this, uh, not in Russia, okay, on the Mars, for example, on Jupiter. But uh, really we, uh, we need to reformat the system because the ministries of health usually is not interested in innovations. Thank you. Thank you, Yaroslav. And uh, I believe the next question also coming from Anish Sat uh, is about uh, private healthcare system in Russia. And um, maybe Dr. Uh, Masliev could also join this, uh, join the discussion. So the question follows, has digital pathology been adopted in private healthcare, such as whole slide scanners? Uh, I, I think it's uh, the question not not only for me. I think that this question is to mainly for Sergey because uh, he involved uh, in uh, the, some scans and he could uh, answer more good this question than I. And I would like to say about uh, about what what have we do and uh, about that Yaroslav said about uh, health uh, ministers and so on healthcare system. So. There was uh, a, a really uh, very, uh, very, very big problems uh, when we deal with the pandemic. Uh, for example, we have uh, we have delivered some some medicine from China, and we need to uh, to, uh, to to give this medicine for our doctors, for our clients, for our patients. But we cannot uh, do it because. Uh, there is no medical license in Russia for this medicine. And this is terrible. I know that uh, Skolko Foundation, uh, they have special program that uh, they can use some uh, foreign medicine uh, in Russia. But uh, the problem was that we bring, for example, Favipiravir, it's Japanese medicine, and that was made also in China. And uh, lots of patients need to get this uh, medicine. But it, it was stay on custom for about a month and we couldn't afford and we couldn't give it to uh, healthcare system in Russia. And this is terrible. I think that uh, we should go another way to cooperate with some foreign com com uh, countries and we should use some international uh, protocols to use it everywhere. The second question uh, was, uh, uh, that um, uh, 
I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just, just again, I forgot that. Uh... Yeah, definitely, there was an example, uh, like a whole slide, a whole slide scanners. So I believe that that could also uh, be addressed to, to Sergey. Um, I'm, I'm, Daddy, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not sure what the whole slide scanners is. I'm very sorry about that. But uh, what I do know is that the digital pathology is definitely the way forward. I think one of the lab laboratories, which is uh, uh, located in Skolkovo Unim, is uh, is able to provide these uh, digital images, which can be transmitted to, for instance, Israel for the review by Israeli doctors. So we don't have it in our clinics yet, but we're definitely looking uh, uh, at implementing one as soon as we launch uh, into the uh, uh, into the uh, in, in, inpatient facility. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And before uh, we run to the final question, uh, there is one question to Yogi. And please, to your mind, uh, what are the ways of Russian Singapore med cooperation and what Singapore companies need to go uh, to, to go ahead with practical steps? Thank you. Thanks, Daria. Uh, I think Today probably is the first step, uh, and the first step is really about us starting to share our own experiences uh, in terms of what are the challenges uh, that we are facing, uh, and what are the solutions we are seeking. Uh, essentially, I think it is about connecting people, uh, connecting communities, uh, and developing a conversation uh, between, between our countries and between our communities. Uh, so to me, I think really the first step is that, and it's today, uh, and I would urge everyone uh, in, this, in this group uh, to try and connect with each other uh, and share your own experiences. Uh, this is probably the first step. Uh, and uh, as I think Yaroslav mentioned, uh, the most important thing is not about the governments or the corporates, it is about the society. Uh, the society needs to, to drive uh, its own initiatives and events. Uh, that's where I think uh, we need to start. From. Thank you. And uh, as we are running to the end of uh, this webinar, I would like to ask one general question to the, each of the speakers that are still uh, with us today. So how shall we educate our future generations to cope with pandemic and aftershocks? Your thoughts in three sentences. A lot. That was brief. <laughs> Yogi, what are your thoughts on this? So uh, how shall we educate our future generations to cope with pandemic and aftershocks? Uh, I am a fan of history. So I, I always believe in, in learning what history has taught us uh, and being aware of the history. But I don't think you can be ever fully prepared uh, for, for new challenges or this. Uh, you just have to take it one step at a time and uh, try to find solutions as you, as you move along the way. Uh, even if for us in Singapore, uh, this is new, to the whole world this is new, uh, and uh, we all just have to, to figure out and find the best solution as we move along. Uh, so I, 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 I wish I could say I knew what to, what to tell people about the future, but I can't. I am agree with uh, Jack Ma that saying that the uh, love and uh, this uh, special spirit delicious is uh, uh, is a cornerstone of many uh, positive changes in the world. I think that's not possible to change only the healthcare system. Uh, we need to start with uh, uh, democracy, with uh, uh, open uh, mindfulness. So, and then uh, I think that, I don't believe that medical society might help us. I believe that uh, artificial intelligence uh, that uh, change the doctors in many, many different uh, situations will help us to go to the ethical uh, healthcare. And then based on the medical ethics, we will go to the uh, good defense from the infectious uh, disease. 
Thank you. And uh, Vladimir. Uh, well, uh, I would say that uh, uh, future generations will uh, educate us rather than we have to think about how we would educate future generations. <laughs> You know, innovations are on their side. Yeah, right. What do you think about uh, educating the future generations to cope with, uh, with this situation? You know, for me as a doctor, uh, one of the main things is not to do self-treatment because lots of people begin some self-treatment with this epidemic. For example, Trump said that you should use chloroquine. Everybody go to pharmacy buy every pack of uh, chloroquine and start to use it. Even doctors start to prevent, to use it in prevention. And what we see, we see not a lot of, but we see uh, not, uh, not, not, not less deaths because people with uh, some heart disease, they take chloroquine, not do ECG, and uh, they, they have many problems. About 30% of people who do self-treatment then will go into hospital and uh, their, uh, their health was dramatically changed. And uh, doctors l did a lot of work to, uh, to treat these patients. So for me, the main thing not to do self-treatment. Thank you, agreed. That's really very important. And uh, Sophia, being on the like, front line of uh, digital transformation, what is your opinion on this? Well, I think that the main thing we should teach our future generations is basically critical thinking to sort all this propaganda and uh, you know fake information fake news from real experience of doctors and health providers and experts and the second thing should probably be stress management because we we're not prepared for this period of uncertainty and many people are suffering. You see a big increase of demand uh, um, of psychological training, uh, coaching and uh, neurologists also. So we have to prepare for that also. And only together we can be prepared. So thank you for being uh, today uh, with this uh, online webinar. We have now approached to the end of this session. And I would like to thank all the speakers and our audience for being here today and asking really great questions. We will be getting back uh, with the post release with the Moscow International Medical Cluster, Enterprise Singapore and Sistema Asia. So thank you and have a great day ahead. <laughs>